On this episode of Common Mystics, we cover the historical context and tragic results of a witch panic in New England that preceded the one in Salem by nearly 30 years. I'm Jennifer James. I'm Jill Stanley. We're psychics. We're sisters. We are Common Mystics. We find extraordinary stories in ordinary places, and today's story comes to you from Hartford, Connecticut. That's right, Jen. There's a lot going on in Hartford. Oh, so much. And there's more to come. (laughs) And there's more to come. Hartford keeps on giving. So Jen and I are in Hartford, Connecticut. We are driving around and we stumble upon the Old South burying ground. But we have to remind you that we set our intention. Jen, can you tell everyone what our intention is? Sure. Our intention was that day, as it always is, to find a verifiable story previously unknown to us that allows us to give voice to the voiceless. That's right. And we are driving through Hartford and we see like this open field, but in the middle of this open field that's gated, there's this one stone structure that looks like a witch's hat. Literally. And I was like, oh, Jen, we're stopping there. I have to go see the witch's hat. And she's like, uh, I don't know if that's safe. I don't think there's an opening. We had to like climb through the back of the cemetery. It turns out it was a cemetery and it was a headstone that looked like a witch's hat. Why are you looking up? Because you- you're silly. It was not literally a witch's hat. It, it was shaped. just like it. It, it was unusual, and the top of it was shaped in like a triangular shape. But the funny thing was we both saw that and immediately said, that is a witch's hat. I don't yes. know if like the average person would have been like, that's a witch's hat. Anyway, so yeah, we, so, we pretty much broke into that cemetery. I remember climbing kind of yes. a wall sort of situation. <laughs> there was a lot of, be careful, be careful, be careful. A lot, a lot of, of that. that going yeah. on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What were you feeling in the cemetery? Because like, let me remind you, this is a large piece of land and it only looked like a cluster of headstones remained. So mm-hmm. we had to, like you said, climb in the back of the cemetery and walk through what seemed to be an open space to right. get to what we had seen from the car. So what were you feeling in that space? The feelings that I was getting there were despair forgotten and the sense that lives were lost or overlooked by time. Very much so. I can Mm -hmm. totally see that. And you? That's how the whole cemetery felt. Didn't it just feel like forgotten? Yes. And out of place because we were kind of in the middle of a city and it was kind Mm -hmm. of gritty and we're standing there in this old cemetery and yeah, it just... So, yeah. Something about that vibe felt uncomfortable. True, true. I was feeling like a gathering, like a crowd gathering in a town square for an event. That's what I was feeling. Mm, mm-hmm. I can see that. And classism came up for me, like the dichotomy, wealthy and poor. But not only that, there is also a dichotomy of good people and bad people, but it seemed off as if the subjective virtues of a few were defining individuals as good and bad. But to me, the quote unquote bad didn't seem bad. And I remember Mm. like, like writing that down, like the bad isn't even that bad. Right. The bad, you're like, the bad's good. And it was like question mark. It was (laughs) right. It was funny. But the bad is good. I don't get it. Right. I don't know if this is relevant or not. But it felt like we were a part of a movie that I've seen before. Like we were on a movie set. It mm-hmm. felt familiar, but it felt staged. Mm-hmm. I heard a quote in my head, and it was, people gave their lives. That's never good. No. Usually. No. It's yeah. usually never good. Well, the way we were feeling, I remember being like, yeah, that's not good. Well, in the context of the despair, forgotten, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I was feeling like a woman or women being prosecuted and that Hester Prynne came up for me from the Scarlet Letter. Okay. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. I think you mean persecuted. Yeah. Or do you mean criminally prosecuted? I think both. Both. Okay. All right. Because she wasn't she both? Um, I don't. That was high school for me. I do not remember that book. I was not a fan. And the movie was terrible. So... (laughs) (laughs) No offense, Demi. You do good work. You do good work. (laughs) 
Sometimes. So I am super excited about the story. It jumped out of the pages of history. Tell us a little bit about Connecticut, what was going on at the time. Set us up. Sure. Why don't we start at the early beginnings? Start at the very beginning. Yes. Okay, okay go Thank on. you for that. The area known today as the state of Connecticut has a very rich history, Jill, that spans over 12,000 years. I don't believe it. It's true. And prior to European colonization, the land was home to certain groups of indigenous peoples, such as the Pequots, the Mohegans, the Pawgussets, and the Scaticotes. I am so impressed with you right now. Okay, me and Google Pronouns had like a session before we logged on. So I, don't, like, be too, don't be too I literally impressed. was just going to be like, just ended at Indigenous people. Like you did yeah, not have your to do that. You're dyslexia talking. I got you. Not like, it's not even dyslexia. This these are, this looks like a different language. <laughs> it is. Like a yeah, full on for sure. like. For sure. Yeah. Okay, okay go on. so all of these different groups are populating the area that we know now as Connecticut. But in the... 1500s, Europeans started coming over, specifically fishermen, travelers, traders, explorers, and they were coming to New England's waters and, of course, interacting with these indigenous groups already living there. Mm -hmm. And these encounters resulted in trade with Europeans exchanging items like axes, kettles, mirrors, bells, hoes. Pose. <laughs> I'm not even going to touch it, but go on. Okay. And what they were getting is, for the most part, valuable animal pelts. Beaver. Apparently, beaver pelts were a big thing. Yeah. Like, I don't know why. Beaver was like the king of animals. I don't know why either. It was probably yeah. waterproof. I don't know. Waterproof, thick and oily. manageable. You know what I mean? Like if you're gonna if you're gonna wrestle something, a beaver would be doable as opposed to I guess like a bear. It just, oh, that's true because I was thinking beavers are so small. Like how many beavers would it take to make a coat? Yeah, but they're they're everywhere and they're easier and it's trap. less deadly. Yeah, yeah, less I, deadly. I, 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 yeah, you never hear about people being attacked by beavers <laughs> unless it's a joke. Oh, okay. Moving on. <laughs> okay. So, the year 1614 marked the arrival of Dutch traders who went on to establish Connecticut's initial European settlement in 1633. Both the Dutch and the English settlers would later establish their communities within Connecticut. The Connecticut River Colony was established on March 3rd, 1636, serving as a settlement for a congregation of Puritans. It has a birthday coming up. And of course, the Puritans were English Protestants devoted to purifying the Church of England from Catholic influences, and they aimed to establish and worship a style that was pure and simple of heart. Yeah, more on the Puritans later. Mm -hmm. But tensions arose between the Dutch and the English as trading posts emerged in the towns of Saybrook and Hartford. Because, of course, they're both – both of these European powers are fighting over these resources and trading rights. Right, right. So what initially began as minor skirmishes escalated into a larger conflict that came to be known as the Pequot War. Can you tell now, me something about the Pequot War? I would love to. Please. The Pequot War occurred when the Pequot people challenged a coalition of English settlers from Massachusetts Bay. They were coming into the colony, and they had their own Native American allies. Mm -hmm. So the goal of this English coalition was to get rid of the Pequots altogether. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to colonize this part of Southern New England. So this marked a substantial class between different Native American groups and the Europeans in Northeastern North America. And it shaped the region's history significantly. And it was a notoriously brutal war. Like these people were going at it. Right. Bad, bad, bad. Right. So it sounds like the English settlers and their allies were fighting the Dutch and their allies. Correct. And ultimately, the victors of the Pequot War were the English. So the English and their indigenous allies won. Now, the Treaty of Hartford happened in 1638, and that served to effectively 
eradicate the Pequot culture altogether. <sighs> they act like the the whole point of this treaty was to eliminate the Pequots. Like it was systematic genocide. They the English and their allies divided up the Pequot prisoners who were made to change their names and stop speaking their tribal language and never return to their Pequot homelands. And after this, the area transitioned into a British colony, shaping the course of Connecticut's history. That's insane and tragic. I know. Do you want to talk more about that on our detours? Because I have so much more to say about that. Yeah, let's detour that. Okay, perfect. So now let's talk about the Puritans. The Connecticut River Colony Puritans. Mm-hmm. Let's let's have at it. Right. Well, they were religious. They were conservative. They were a righteous group of people. And let's face it, they were famously intolerant. I just wanted to say, like, famously is an understatement. People, what's interesting about this to me is that everyone thinks of the Puritans and they think of the pilgrims and yay, we had Thanksgiving. But they were, like, not coming here for religious freedom. They were coming here for the freedom to be the dominating religion. And if you were cool with them, then you're cool. But if you ain't cool with them, you ain't cool. So that is 100% true. Do you want to go on a little deep dive with me here? Do it. All right. Let's take a minute to define this group that we're calling Puritans. Is that okay with you? I would love it. They first started to form during the English Reformation in the mid-1500s with King Henry VIII. You remember King Henry VIII? I sure do. He was married to Catherine of Aragon, remember? Yes. But he had a problem. He has so many problems. He did have so many problems. But one big problem for him was the fact that he wasn't getting a son from Catherine of Aragon. It was a big deal. He wanted to annul his marriage. He went to the Pope. Pope said no. And then King Henry said, screw you, Pope, and made himself the head of the Church of England and broke with Catholicism and the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this caused religious upheaval in England when the king made this break with the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church, and some groups applauded this break. But other groups were not happy for a lot of different reasons. There was one group that thought that Henry didn't go far enough. In other words, they're like, yeah, you broke off with the church in name, but you're still doing churchy things. You're still doing all the same shit. And They were called Puritans, not by themselves, Jill. That was a contemptible name that their enemies gave them. They were making fun of them. They're like, you're all pure and shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. So it was a term of contempt. And their enemies saw them as slaves to their Bibles and or hypocrites. Hypocrites who judged others who held different beliefs than they did. Like from the Mm -hmm. very beginning, there was this idea about them. And some splinter Puritan groups were even more radical than others and separated entirely from the Church of England and lived in the in communities of, quote unquote, saints. Yeah, they called themselves saints. That's Visible always saints. a red flag. No kidding. That's I can see why always... that would be annoying, right? Oh, my God, yes. Continue. Right. And so one group feared their safety in England. And they left for Holland in 1608, but Holland was too accepting of a place, like you said, and they welcomed everyone. So in 1620, a group of Puritans famously came over to the quote-unquote New World on the Mayflower, and about 10 years later, there was another larger and better financed Puritan group that established itself in the Massachusetts Bay Area. They took root in a big, big way, and Puritanism spread throughout New England, including into that Connecticut colony. Wow. Thank you for that. Wasn't that fun? (gasps) It was fun. But I want to say that the way we think of the Pilgrims and the Puritans, it was actually how Holland just really is. Just saying. What do you mean how Holland just really is? Because Holland was really a place like everyone just come. We don't care. You worship you. And they like that was really what Holland was. Right. And they're like, wow, this is too liberal. We need we need restraints on this. We want everyone to be like us. Exactly. Like we don't want everyone to have religious freedom. We want the freedom to make everybody else do what we say. Like that's exactly. what we mean by freedom. Sorry. And welcome. <laughs> welcome to America. <laughs> no shit. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't no. easy for them. 
Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Life was incredibly challenging in the quote unquote new world. And I'm going to stop saying quote unquote. Just know, people, when I say new world, I know, I know it wasn't really a new world. I know people were already living there. A Every time I say it, it's world. got the quotes. They knew it would be difficult because they were carving out new lives across the ocean, but they didn't anticipate just how difficult it would be. They didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't know the different climate. They didn't know the different agriculture. Oh, right. Um, They were also very different from other groups of European settlers who were coming to this land. Most of the time, Jill, the settlers were enterprising young men who were looking for economic opportunities and adventure. But the Puritans, they really believed that they were led by God himself to create a new society. The and land they, of Canaan. Mm-hmm, and they brought their entire families to what they would have considered an uncivilized land to create a Zion. They thought they were following God's plan. Yeah. So when they encountered Oof. natural hardships in 17th century New England, like the scarcity of supplies, illness, conflicts with indigenous peoples, struggling with shelter and food, you name it. Many of them interpreted these as resulting from forces of evil. I mean, what they were thinking was, like, we are establishing the chosen land. God would save us from these hardships. So, of course, right. we are wonderful, God-fearing people. We don't deserve this. We're doing God's will. Right. So, naturally, they thought it must be some evil force working against them. So, witchcraft. Hence, witchcraft, exactly. Here we are. Always witchcraft. Mm. Now, I don't understand. How does it always get to witchcraft? Like, you have a bad day? Fucking witches. Like, how does that happen? Where does that come from? Well, like I said, not all Puritans held the same beliefs. There were different factions with varying ideas. And during the mid-1630s, the Puritan leaders already had varying beliefs long before they set foot in North America. But conflicts like this led to power struggles among church leadership and differing church doctrine between different Puritan communities. So we have a sense of conflict within the ranks and people splitting off and doing their own thing. And religion wasn't the only bone of contention, of course. They had a tough time establishing and and enforcing civil and political policies. So we're talking about power, religion, and power. And Puritan leaders were desperate to get ahead in the colonies. Remember, resources are scarce. Mm. And the leaders were often ambitious and fighting tooth and nail amongst themselves to make gains in acquiring estates and property and resources, even if it meant stepping on someone else. And it wasn't just about survival. It was about making a name for themselves. They wanted to be the big shots in the Connecticut River Valley. Oh, my gosh. The struggles, the ambition, the never-ending quest for success— Drama. I can totally see a new series like Cabin Wives of Connecticut River Colony. Or Puritan see Wives. It? Oh, sure. Or oh, Puritan Wives. Oh, that's good. You like that? That's sticky. Yes. Yes. I love it. <laughs> All right. Neighborhood disputes escalated into lengthy legal battles and sometimes even resulted in violent clashes on the roads of the colony. Do you believe that? That, that does not sound like holy people. It does Come not sound like, now. yeah. Correct. The escalating tensions were not only believed to originate within the colony, but also from external influences. Surprisingly, these conflicts arose among these, quote unquote, devout individuals. And it is at this point when virtuous souls, irrational superstitions, and disruptive behaviors intertwined with the realms of politics, religion, and law giving birth to the notion that a banal evil lurked throughout the colony in the guise of a witch. And the concept of witches, witch hunts, and accusations of witchcraft emerged during the early 15th centuries. These archaic ideas took root here in Connecticut for the first time in the New World and reshaped American history. Okay, now I just want to put a button on this. So we have these holier-than-thou righteous people who are 
settled in this area. And it turns out that these are just men with the same kind of evil intentions that every man has that fights against themselves in. And they find themselves behaving badly. And instead of owning their behavior and saying, you know what, maybe my intentions are less godly and more greed, ambition, whatever. They're like, you know what, a witch got me. Right. In the context of incredible pressure, not only pressure from outside influences, and but pressure from inside their own community and also struggling for survival. Like I mm. can't think of a greater pressure cooker. It's literally coming at them from all sides. And when that happens, Ugh. bad things happen. Bad things happen. There's got to be a witch. Right. There's got to be a witch. Okay. Tell me a little bit about the Hartford Witch Panic. Okay. So witchcraft was once a capital offense punishable by death. Can you believe it? I can't actually. In 1642, the laws of the Connecticut colony were not only based on those of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and England, but were also supported by the Bible. Old Testament scriptures did condemn witchcraft. Here are a few examples. Hmm. Exodus chapter 22, verse 17, you shall not tolerate sorcery. I mean, that's very vague. What are we talking about? Sorcery. No comment. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 26, you shall not engage in divination or fortune telling. Hmm. That's a little more specific, but Leviticus <laughs> is just a downer anyway. I'm kind of you starting to I mean? sweat a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. I'm not going to be honest here. It's hitting, give me hitting another, close to home. <laughs> give me another Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27. Both men and women who possess a ghost or a familiar spirit shall be put to death. They mm. shall be stoned and the responsibility for their bloodshed lies with them. Dude. Okay, that you- <laughs> you're bringing me down, Bible. You're bringing me you're down. Bringing me down. Okay, so okay. there's that. So, Jen, from a, a historical standpoint, the targeting of individuals as witches by the Connecticut colonists could be attributed to the challenges they faced as a colony and the desire to improve their social status in the New World. But do we know why certain people were targeted and who they were? Like, this is happening. We need there, there to be a witch. Who would be the likely suspect of a being a witch and why? Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about that. Mm. According to the Weathersfield Historical Society of Weathersfield, Connecticut, in the article, Connecticut's Witch Trials, and I quote, those accused of witchcraft were thought to have signed a compact with the devil, choosing him over God and thereby gaining supernatural powers. A person exhibiting pride, discontent, greed, and lying risked being believed to be a witch. So basically, if you dis- if you exhibited those human emotions, you were at risk of being accused of witchcraft. Wow. Mm -hmm. In this very tumultuous, unstable, unsafe, stressful environment. Yeah. Well, not only that, but who is deeming that you're being proudful, discontent, greedy? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's so subjective. Yeah. And this was a time of prevailing patriarchal views that regarded women as second-class citizens. Not coincidentally, the majority of those executed as witches, both in Connecticut and elsewhere, were, of course, women. Many mm. of them living on the fringes of society, and often they were impoverished, and some were single mothers. Now, this is mm. not new. Research. I know. The research consistently indicates that men are more prone to criminal behavior than women. It's just a fact. Case in mm. point, in February 2017, the Federal Bureau of Prisons reported that 93.3% of federal inmates were male in the United States. Mm. That That is a large, large disparity. And Scholars, there's a lot of different reasons for this gender gap in crime, and we're not going to get into it here. But just know that, yeah, that existed existed in the 17th century as well as it does today, right? Mm, However, yeah. so go ahead. But the men are in charge. 
the men are in charge, and also there are specific types of crimes that are more focused on women, and those types of crimes are moral in nature. Doesn't it just get you? Just gets me. <laughs> Right. It's like a gut punch. Right. L- laws targeting moral crimes focused primarily on women and enforced by men and religious leaders to uphold social and religious norms. And accusations of witchcraft arose from, for instance, perceptions about female sexuality, reactions against a woman's independence or expression of nonconformist ideas, and also greed because – women could potentially inherit their husband's estates. And so by getting rid of women, it created a situation where their lands might be available. Mm. 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 So Mm. let's get back to the Hartford witch trial, shall we? Yes, please. Now, admittedly, there is limited supporting documentation available regarding the specific accusations, the trials, the executions of the victims involved in these early witch trials. However, here is what we do know. Hartford, Connecticut, holds the distinction of being the site of the first large-scale witch trials in the American colonies, happening, happening nearly 30 years before the infamous Salem witch trials. I have no clue. These, did you know that? I did not. I always that's, assumed Salem was the first because that's what's like in our cultural histo- history, you know, and yeah, the history of the our zeitgeist. culture. It's always like, yeah, it's always like Salem, but no. And these, like I said, happened before Sal- the Salem witch trials intermittently between 1647 and 1697. 50 years. 50 years of this bullshit. On and off for 50 years. Okay, tell me about it. Okay, Tell so me we, about the first victim. We do know about the first victim. Her name was Elsie Young. Unfortunately, there isn't much information available about Elsie Young's early life. We know that she was born around 1600 in Windsor, Connecticut. And she is sometimes referred to by other names like Alice Young or don't even try it. A C H S A H. Oxa Young. Yeah, just And she's yeah. sometimes referred to as Alice Young. But Elsie was married to John Young, and they had a daughter named Alice. In 1647, Elsie Young was accused of witchcraft. Her community erected a gallows for her in May of that year, and she was hanged for crimes that she was accused of. And it's worth noting that during her trial, there was an influenza epidemic in New England, including in her hometown of Windsor. And that outbreak may have had something to do with the accusations against her, but certainly would have created a stressful, if not panicked, climate during the time of her accusal. Elsie's daughter, Alice, faced witchcraft accusations also in Springfield, Massachusetts, 30 years later. Now, while Alice didn't suffer the same fate as her mother, historical records are unclear about the punishment she received. Yeesh. So is Elsie or her daughter are voiceless? Actually, I don't think so, Jill. There's someone else who comes out from the history. Tell me. What are you even saying right now? Well, there is a woman. Because that shit's pretty sad. <laughs> that shit That's is pretty, pretty sad. sad. And That's I hate that her sad. daughter was also accused. Like, what's up with that? You know what else? It's like, so everyone's sick and dying, and they really, do you think these people really believed that there was a witch, or do you think that they killed Elsie just to get property? Like, why do you, do you really believe that they're like, everyone's dying because everyone's sick, and there has to be a witch, let's sacrifice Elsie? I believe these people did believe in witchcraft, for real. Okay. Now, did some people use that fear as an excuse to get rid of people when convenient? Probably. Okay. But I do believe that they believed in witchcraft. Hell, I believe in witchcraft. Anyway, (laughs) moving on. So So, out of the history. Our voiceless. Yes. Out of the history comes a woman named Rebecca Greensmith. Who's she? When the witch panic of Hartford hit in the spring of 1662, four people were executed for the crime of witchcraft. 
And the situation started to boil over with the death of a woman named Elizabeth Kelly, who was believed to have been cursed. Mm. Now, during the same time frame, a woman named Anne Cole started to have the quote-unquote fits. And these fits were also believed to be a product of some witchery or some curse. Soon, a bunch of other people throughout Hartford were stepping forward claiming to have been afflicted by demonic possession at the hands of their neighbors. And the stories from Hartford seriously scared the shit out of people. (laughs) Sorry. No, tell me. One lady, one lady said that Satan made her speak with a Dutch accent. Okay, that (laughs) accents are kind of creepy. That would scare me. Like if all of a sudden I was just like talking in a different language or a different accent. Yeah. Another person swore that they saw their neighbors transforming into big black hounds. Okay. So (laughs) to me, someone needed to get an update in eye exam because that doesn't seem like that's what you saw. They need to go to Lens Crafters. Yeah. Yeah. Like for sure. Yeah. That's unusual. But there were other people who claimed that they saw witches dancing with the devil at night. Mm. So to me, this seems like someone's a little jelly pie that the devil wasn't like, can I have this dance? I mean, it sounds like a party. I know. But that was merely the beginning. In the following year, an additional 10 individuals would face accusations and four of them would be put to death for their supposed crimes. And among the ill-fated quartet were Rebecca Greensmith and her husband, Nathaniel. Okay, so who were the Greensmiths? Are they dancing with the devil? Okay. Are they transforming? Let tell me, tell me you. everything. Well, there's not much official information available, Jill, about Nathaniel Greensmith. But according to our research, he was born in 1626 in Hartford, Connecticut. Sometime in the late 1650s, he tied the knot with Rebecca. Now, Rebecca, born Rebecca Steele in 1629 in Devon, England, made her way to America at some point. We're not sure when. But by the time she met Nathaniel, she had already been married twice. You see, her first marriage was to a man named Abraham Elson of Wethersfield, and they had two kids together. But Elson passed away in 1646, and Rebecca married a man named Jarvis Mudge in 1649 in New London, and they had three children together. Unfortunately, Mudge also died in 1653, and that's when she married her third husband, Nathaniel Greensmith. Now, Rebecca and Nathaniel didn't have any children together. Although Nathaniel would have been stepfather to Rebecca's children from her two previous marriages. That's right. The couple resided on the south banks of Little River, where Nathaniel owned a 20-acre plot of farmland. But Nathaniel had more properties as well. You see, he possessed other holdings in the vicinity of Hartford, which brought about the envy and disdain towards the Greensmith name all throughout the town. Mm -mm -mm. So they just didn't like him? Well, they didn't like him. It sounds like they were jealous, and he faced accusations of petty crimes on multiple occasions as well. So he might have been a criminal. They accused him of theft of a hoe. Here, here, Hoes were really important, apparently. Hoes were a really big deal for a lot of reasons. All throughout history, you need a good hope. (laughs) Hang in there, guys. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. We are so excited to unveil the first book in our series entitled Common Mystics Present Ghost on the Road, Volume 1, Murders and Mysterious Deaths. It's everything you love about Common Mystics and more. It's a retelling of 10 of our favorite stories from our pod with exciting extras. Extras like souvenirs, what we took away from the experience, And what to know if you go, if you decide to travel in our footsteps. Pre-order the Kindle edition now. All other formats of the book will be available for purchase at Amazon.com on July 1st, 2023. Thanks, guys. Now back to the show. 
I will tell you this. I don't think that he was guilty of these crimes. I think that people were jealous of him and making stuff up to send the police over. Like, there's no way Nathaniel's going to be making all this money on the up and up. Like, he has to be doing something on the side. I don't know. There are a lot of pretty specific accusations here. Not, and not only hoe stealing. Also, <laughs> he was accused of stealing bushels of wheat. And he was accused of perjury and battery. I wonder who he beat up. Well, if you know... I don't know, Jill. I don't know. Did they deserve it? I don't know. I don't know. We don't know the story. Okay, so people didn't like Nathaniel. What about Rebecca? Okay. His wife, Rebecca, unfortunately, wasn't well-liked either. Wah, wah. My God. There's evidence of this. There was a document written by her minister, John Whiting, and he made derogatory remarks about her. That's so rude. Right? And listen to this. He described her as, quote, lewd, ignorant, and of considerable age. Wow. Are you even kidding me? Of wow. Con- All right. Age? Really? I thought that they, like, revered people who were, like, they're, older. Yeah, they're seniors. Like, they're how is of that, the like, and, and lewd and ignorant? It just sounds like he didn't like, I mean, it sounds like us, to be quite honest. (laughs) Well, I was thinking, like, what do you think Father Farron wrote about you? Well, I mean, nothing good. I mean, we're lewd. Father Farron loved us. I can be, I can see people calling us lewd, ignorant, and of considerable age. I mean, dude. That just hit home. It does hit home. So much of this episode. (laughs) You know, I forget it. I don't want to record it anymore. Leviticus. Shut up, Leviticus. (laughs) Who asked Leviticus? (laughs) Who asked him? Okay. All right. All right. So now, remember, remember that spring of 1662 in Hartford, there was a community riddled with animosity and discord. And it was a time when Elizabeth Kelly had recently passed away because she had been cursed, apparently. Mm -hmm. And then Anne Cole is having her fits. And they were characterized by violent tremors and utterance of blasphemous words. Okay, so when you first said fits, I was thinking like epilepsy. Now mm-hmm. it seems more of like a Tourette situation. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Mm-hmm. So consumed by an overwhelming conviction that she was under the grip of an evil force, Anne Cole, a woman of great piety, bore the mm-hmm. weight of her affliction with utmost dread. She would speak at length about how malevolent spirits were tormenting her. You know what? If she really was a pious woman like like the community believed her to be, and she did have Tourette's, that would have been incredibly hard. Yeah, I continue, because I don't know how I feel about Anne. All right, I will. In a short amount of time, her father, John, enlisted the help of two ministers. Okay, I can see that. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, and Anne informed the ministers that a group of individuals who were acquainted with evil, quote-unquote, had conspired against her to inflict harm. Okay, Anne, I'm I'm having less empathy for you now. Yeah. To make matters even more intriguing, it was reported that after spending some time with the ministers, she began to speak with a Dutch accent. The ministers interpreted this as a sign of witchcraft, as it was inconceivable for someone like Anne Cole to feign or adopt a Dutch accent, even though Dutch people resided nearby in Hartford at the time. Now, Anne's quote-unquote episodes became more frequent within the confines of her father's home, as well as in public among the people of Hartford. And the consensus among the Coles, the religious leaders, and the wider community was that the perpetrator behind these fits could be None other than Anne's neighbor, Rebecca Greensmith. Okay, stop. I just want to say this. If I'm Rebecca Greensmith and I am just at home, like, sweeping out, you know, my my kitchen, and Anne's, like, losing her mind next door, <laughs> inside the house, outside the house, like, just talking all kinds of crazy shit, being like, the devil, the devil, I would be like, something's wrong with <laughs> Anne. Like, I would not, like... I, I'd be like, you guys are looking at me? I'm like, she is, look at her. Mm. You're really, I'm, like, I think it's Anne. I think it's Anne and she lost control. Yeah, I don't disagree. Anne's, Anne seems like the crazy one here. Maybe that's why Anne had to turn attention to someone else. Yeah. And be like, it's, it's not me. Someone is doing this to me. 
But if you were, if like, if if you were under a spell, like she knows a lot of specifics here. <laughs> she does. So, you know what I mean? She mm-hmm. knows a lot, way too much about how this would come about. Like if you were really innocently just afflicted with something like this, I wouldn't be able to put like, it must be someone familiar with the devil. Like she knows way too much about right. the situation. I mean, just I saying. know, I know you're suspicious of Ann Cole. I get it. But the minister's the community, they were not suspicious of Anne. They turned all of their attention to Rebecca. And well, sure, because Anne's young and cute and, and she's pious. This isn't like her at all. Jill, I think you're projecting just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the old fat witch alone. <laughs> she deserves to live. Okay, go on. Rebecca right. <laughs> was arrested and jailed under the accusations that she was a witch. And you wouldn't believe it. But soon enough, everyone had their own crazy stories about Rebecca Greensmith. Of course they did. They said that she spoke in weird accents. They said that she danced strangely. Well, they said she is charged. <laughs> and they said that she had shown the ability to transform herself into other forms. Like, Whatever. I don't know, hounds. <laughs> the two reverends, Joseph Haynes and John Whiting. Oh, the John Whiting is her reverend, the one who called her lewd, ignorant, and old, by the way. Mm-hmm. Joseph Haynes and John Whiting, those two reverends, they went and they talked to Rebecca. And they came away with some conclusions. Guess what? That she's a sweet old <laughs> woman that's been through a lot in her life and we should just leave her alone. Eh. They said that she confessed that she was indeed a witch and that she did have some kind of super strong connection to the devil. And you know what's even crazier? Her husband, Nathaniel, he was involved too, according to the Mm -hmm. reverends. They said that he had insane, inhuman strength, stronger than two men combined. And he was always followed by packs of wild animals. I mean... Kind of like a St. Francis from the hood. Like, what are we describing here? (laughs) What is that? I was thinking of like Dennis taking the dogs for a walk. That's what I was thinking of. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't know. Like, what? What are you saying? He could have just had like seeds in his pocket. You know what I mean? These stories from these reverends, there it it gets more and more outlandish. Tell me everything. They didn't stop there. They came up with a whole list of people from the Hartford area, whom they said that Rebecca named as witches. So they left with a whole list of other culprits, other witches. Oh, my God. Now, on December 30th, 1662, both Rebecca and Nathaniel were charged with having ties to the devil. The indictments against them were identical and said that they were doing crazy supernatural things that only the devil could help them do. And according to the law, they deserved to die for them. The trial was scheduled for early January 1663 in Hartford. Nathaniel insisted he was innocent, but Rebecca, Rebecca did confess. On Tuesday, January 20th, 1663, Rebecca, Nathaniel, and another condemned woman, Mary Barnes, were led to the city square in front of the bell tower of the Hartford Church of Christ. A crowd gathered as the three were loaded onto an ox cart bound for Sentinel Hill, northwest of town, where their hanging awaited. While Rebecca's confession had secured her a swift death, Nathaniel and the other convicted individual were not as fortunate. That was the end of Rebecca Greensmith. Okay. So I have a couple things I want to ask you. Please. Okay. So in the first example of Elsie, there is a flu pandemic, right? People are dying. They kill Elsie. I'm assuming the flu was still going on. So they were probably like, oh, yeah, that one isn't a witch. (laughs) People are still dying. But in this situation, do you think that the accusations around town, the craziness that Ann Cole was displaying, those accusations stopped? Like everyone was just acting normal again? Because it seems like... Their, their suspicions are building on each other, like snowballing, and everyone's believing something that just isn't true. Right. And I think you kind of just described what a panic is. 
A panic isn't mm. a one and done. A panic is ongoing. It continues. It's contagious. And remember, the reverends left with a to be continued. They left with a list of other witches to look into. So they had it out. Just in yeah. case shit kept happening after Nathaniel and Rebecca were murdered, they still weren't wrong, right? They, it right. wouldn't be that they were wrong, that these people were mistakenly accused and put to death. No, 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 no. It just meant that there are more witches still in action. So that was their out. There was a trial for all the people. And the people that, from from the list that Rebecca supposedly gave the reverends, yeah. there was only the, the three that were convicted of murder. So none of the other ones were put to death? No. Okay. Well, that's good news. I think... I think if I recall correctly, I believe that, of course, only the three were put to get death. One was convicted but not put to death because there wasn't enough evidence. But the others, I believe, were on trial as well and weren't convicted. So why do you think Rebecca confessed? I think if you're caught in that situation, it's pretty much plausible that you're going to die. Right. And it's just like, how do you want to die at this point? Do you think she was a witch? Do you think that she did practice witchcraft? Absolutely not. You not don't. In the way, no, I don't believe anything that these people are saying right now. What do you think Rebecca wants us and the world to know? That she confessed solely so that she can have a death that was less torturous. Okay. That's what I really believe. And I don't believe that she gave the reverends a names of other people. I really don't. Mm, I don't either. And so I think I think that she I think that she was a rough person. She probably didn't fit the mold of the obedient wife. And Nathaniel was already unliked when he married her by the community. Right. So she kind of married into this situation. And I don't think she was a bad person though. No, I just think she had a hard life. Yeah. This is her third husband. Right. Right. Yeah. So I I agree with you. I think she was innocent. I think that she was a good person. And I think she wants us to know that good people were murdered for really no reason. How do you think we can be so sure that is Rebecca's spirit that's reaching out to us? I think that you found a really compelling answer to that question. And I would love for you to share it. So do you remember when we were discussing the witch's hat yes. looking gravestone yes. in the old South burial grounds? Yes. So Rebecca's fourth great grandson is buried there. No way. Yeah. So Rebecca and her first husband, Abraham Elson, had a daughter named Sarah. Sarah married William Sanford Hills. They had a son named Ebenezer Hills Sr., and he married Abigail. They had a son, you guessed it, Ebenezer Jr. Ebenezer Jr. had a son with Hannah, and their son's name was Amos Hills. Now, Amos Hills had a son named Seth Hills, and it's Seth Hills who is buried in the Old South Burial Grounds in Hartford. Not only that... But it, his headstone wasn't visible to us at the time. So it was kind of a metaphor for the forgotten as well. Wow. Okay. I am speechless because we saw a stone, a headstone, that to us resonated as a witch's hat. We had to get into that cemetery. And when we did, we were standing at the place where the descendant of Rebecca Greensmith was buried. Correct. Jill, where is she buried? No one knows. Her body was discarded. Lost. Her lost. body was lost to time. These stories, the stories of the Connecticut witch trials that lasted 50 years and many innocent people, in my point of view, had been put to death. No one knows these stories. That in itself was lost to time. Yeah, 100%. Why do you think this story is important today? You know, I and don't do th be preachy. I won't. I won't. I'm I'm not preachy about this kind of stuff, but 
I do think that this story is going to resonate with a lot of people listening for a lot of reasons. For instance, the idea of fear-driven dynamics, modern-day scapegoating, fear-mongering and politics and media, also the lack of due process and reliance on hearsay in Mm. trials and in making decisions within our justice system, that whole mob mentality, and the idea of gender and its role in social political issues as well. I love it. It's so true. So I would say if we were looking at this story, where do you see the similarities happening today for you? Love it. Right. And, you know, everybody listening can think of their own examples, but those are the themes, I think, that come th- that come through in this story that were relevant then and are still relevant today. And we'll just leave it there. I like it. Jennifer. Yeah. Let's go over our hits. Oh, my gosh. That freaking witch's hat, I can't. I just can't. I know. Because it wasn't a witch's hat. But both of I us know. looked at it. We could have said clown hat. We could have said party hat. Nope. That triangular stone was a witch's hat to both of us. True statement. That True spirit statement. right there. What about your feelings in the cemetery? Well, feeling despair, I think I was definitely picking up on Rebecca and her energy, but forgotten her, like we already said, not only was her body forgotten, but this entire situation is largely forgotten. We're not talking about this panic. You know, we zero in on the Salem witch trials because some guy wrote a book about it and became like a big sensation and shit, but like... There's more. There's more. There's a greater context here. It wasn't just a one and done. Like, this was happening. That's such a good point. This wasn't a one and done. This has been happening. Yes. You're absolutely right. Thank you. The gathering of the (gasps) town square, the event. Yes, that was yours. I feel like people were gathered around watching the condemned be loaded on the cart and being carried off to the hill northwest of town. I believe they were watched. They watched them hang. Oh, you know what? And it makes me think about the Anne Cole. Like, what was she feeling that day that these people were hung? Yeah, exactly. What was going through her mind? Or the rest of the community, they were making up stories about Rebecca transforming and dancing with the devil. Right. And just because you're a weird dancer doesn't make you a witch. No. Although they're not mutually exclusive. You True. Can, you can be a lousy dancer and a good witch. And a witch. And a yeah. witch, Yeah. So that that concept of wealthy and poor, as well as good and bad based on virtue, that I think has a big place in this story, because I think that if you were wealthy and unliked, that made you a target by people who well, wanted your shit. Well, I'll tell you this. So I was looking at Nathaniel's will, and there is some indication that Sarah specifically had gotten some money from Nathaniel, her stepfather's estate when he died, but nothing is discussed about his different holdings throughout Hartford or the 20 acres of land just south of the banks of the river. Very interesting. So in Mm -hmm. terms of historical documents, it vanished. Yeah, his property vanished or was absorbed elsewhere and not by his family. Right. And then again, that idea that if someone isn't virtuous the way you defined virtue, that they must be bad or evil. Mm. Mm -hmm. The feeling like a movie set. And what do you think that means? I feel like we've seen this before. Like the stage was set for this to happen and then to happen again. That's what I think that means. Mm -hmm. And we've seen, you've seen movies about witch trials. Yeah. Yeah. So none that was like memorable. And that quote that I heard in my head, people gave their lives. That could have been Rebecca Greensmith herself talking to me at that moment. I believe you're right. And the prosecute, the persecuted, prosecuted woman, Hester Hester Prynne. Prynne. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obvious. Right. I don't have to explain it. We have smart listeners. mm -hmm. Women being prosecuted. And Mm -hmm. persecuted, persecuted and prosecuted. Mm -hmm. All works. All All right. Well, on that note, what did you learn? (laughs) (laughs) I learned that I don't have to go looking outside myself at all. Oh, no. You're talking with an accent. You must be evil. (laughs) If I'm looking for my heart's desire again. I'm learning that Hartford, Connecticut is really charged. Mm -hmm. And 
Just saying, it's not lost on me that the banks of the river is also where a lot of things happened with the cult family and mm. where their land was. So, so the banks south of the, of the river are pretty significant of energy in that area. What are you learning? Well, I learned never to steal someone else's hoe. Mm. We'll leave it People at that. People be coming. People be coming for you. But what if what if the hoe wanted to go with you? That's fine. That's fine. And I say hoe with love. You know what I mean? I know you like, do. S- slut faming. Yes, yes, and yes. Okay. You know we're talking about a farm implement, right? Mm, that's not <laughs> okay. That's let's not let's what I let's was close. About. Okay. Please check out our website, commonmystics.net. Follow us at our socials at Common Mystics Pod. Please listen in wherever you're listening to your favorite pods. Please consider leaving us a positive review. We love reading them and we love sharing them. Thank you so much. Subscribe, download, like, and share. Share, share, share. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Good night. Good night. This has been a Common Mystics Media production. Editing done by Yokai Audio, Kalamazoo, Michigan.